Good morning, everybody. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Christian Spahn. I'll teach philosophy here at the Department of the Kim Young University in South Korea. I have studied in Germany and the USA, and I have written a book on Hegel's philosophy of biology many, many years ago. And um, before I start, I would like, first of all, to say that it would be very nice and really great if we could all meet together in Spain, that would be a much more beautiful situation than me talking to the wall. But at least we can meet online. It will be a little bit late for me, but I'm already looking forward to that. And we were asked uh, to uh, record our presentations. Uh, of course, uh, I've never done that before, but um, I think it will work out fine. Uh, secondly, I want to apologize for, for the room I'm in. It's not a very academic looking room full of bookshelves. Uh, I was Googling if I can add some some fake background, but I don't have the technology to do that. Uh, but uh, I have in this room, I have all the, uh, the setup uh, in my office. I don't have a good webcam and I use this mic also for my online teaching. So, well, so I thought at least I'll put some Hegel on the piano. Yeah? I'm not going to sing, but... Uh, so that you know uh, I actually uh, am a scholar. Today I would like to speak about the theology and the idea of life in Hegel's logic, and I will start my presentation now. The title of my talk is Teleology and the Idea of Life in Hegel's Logic. In my talk, I want to focus on challenges that arise when we look at the relationship between Hegel's logic and his philosophy of nature. It can be argued that Hegel's philosophy of biology is one of the strongest chapters in Hegel's philosophy of nature. It can further be argued that Hegel's understanding of organic life underscores the necessity and power of dialectical thinking, as Hegel himself claims, you know, only Somebody who knows dialectics can understand Hegel. Uh, so, no, sorry, can understand life, Hegel says. Well, both is true. So to make good on these claims would require us to interpret and apply the dialectical understanding of Hegel's notions of teleology onto the phenomenon of organic life and evaluate its fruitfulness in detail. I would like to approach the Hegelian text today, however, from the opposite direction. What can we learn about Hegel's treatment of teleology and the idea of life in his logic if we start out from looking at the corresponding passages in the philosophy of nature first? We will see that Hegel's attempt to connect the development of pure thought of his logic with the investigations of his philosophy of nature leads to peculiar problems concerning the architecture of Hegel's system as a whole that are not easy to solve. First part of my talk, a mismatch between, sorry, a mismatch in the correlations between the logic and the philosophy of nature. If we want to study Hegel's philosophy of nature, then we are told by Hegel that the necessity of the notions that are employed by him to describe natural phenomena are not just a result of empirical investigations, but a result of dialectical conceptual explications. For Hegel to understand a part of nature, those means to grasp the philosophical necessity of this part of reality in and for the process of the self-realization of the absolute idea. One important consequence of this philosophical stance is Hegel's attempt to correlate the philosophical understanding of natural and cultural phenomena with the corresponding dialectical unfolding of logical notions. In Hegel's philosophy of nature, he characterizes life as the existing idea, while the idea itself in the logic is characterized as the unity of concept and reality, or the unity of subjectivity and objectivity. If we want to understand Hegel's interpretation of life in nature, then we are required to study the Logik des Begriffs. But where exactly should we find the logical notions and categories that are fundamental for Hegel's philosophy of biology? 
Well, it seems obvious to point to the chapter called Das Leben, Life, in Hegel's logic. The subdivision of this part match exactly with the structure of Hegel's analysis of life in his organic, in his philosophy of nature. But we can also easily notice that the preceding chapter in the logic called Objectivity closely corresponds to the structure of the philosophy of nature as a whole. The first chapter Chapter Mechanism corresponds to the part called Mechanic of the Philosophy of Nature. Chemism is the culmination point of the section called Physics. And surely, for Hegel, organic life is characterized by teleology. So how do we match these two overlapping correspondences exactly? Are there two chapters that are related to Hegel's organic, one called Teleology and another one called Life? A closer look tells us that teleology that is discussed in the logic is primarily external teleology. While Hegel explicitly tells us in the chapter on life in the logic that life is characterized by inner teleology. Assuming a linear correspondence between the philosophy of nature and logic leads us to the obvious question why the chapter called life isn't the last chapter of the chapter objectivity. In other words, why do we find here in the logic instead something else, namely a treatment of primarily extrinsic teleological relations? The order seems, at least at first glance, and coming from the philosophy of nature, reversed. What are we to make of the striking mismatch between the development of concepts in Hegel's logic as opposed to their application or appearance in the real philosophy? And what are the consequences of this reversal of order, both for the chapter on teleology in the logic and for the understanding of organisms in Hegel's organic? To approach an answer to these questions, I will first shortly sketch the dialectical notion of organisms that is central to Hegel's organic, I will then, secondly, compare and contrast this notion of organic life with what is said in the chapters on teleology and life in the logic. I do so so that I can argue for some structural changes that might help to solve the discussed problem of uh, the mismatch and that might, generally speaking, be advantageous for Hegel's philosophy of biology. Part number two life as a dialectical synthesis of nature. Hegel conceptualizes organic life as a form of existence that unites two opposing modes of being, whose logical conceptualizations are discussed in his chapter on mechanism and chemism. A mechanical object, like for example a stone or a planet, is characterized by a set of changing external relations that it can go through without changing its inner essential identity. A moving stone is just as much, not more, not less, of a stone than a stone at rest, a hot one, not more than a cool one, and so forth. Qualitative identity of a mechanical entity is therefore compatible with certain kinds of non-essential changes, just as long as the stability of the self-identity is not threatened. Mechanical physics for Hegel looks therefore at external changes to otherwise self-identical objects. Opposingly, in a chemical process, however, an object or element changes their quality, or element changes its quality and therefore its essential identity, or it might even get completely dissolved. We then, sorry, we then speak of a new different kind of element as the outcome of the chemical transformation. The product is essentially not the same as the educt. We observe changing transformations without the preservation of identity on the level of the interacting substances. So mechanism, the dominance of self-stability without inner change, and chemism, the dominance of change without self-identity, are the two opposing concepts 
that I juxtaposed in the chapters on mechanism and chemism in the logic, as well as in the corresponding passages of Hegel's philosophy of nature. Both in mechanism and chemism we can further find external causality. Dynamic mechanical processes are determined by a balance of forces that are conserved and stay the same. This conservation of balance, however, is not itself existing as another thing or mechanical object, but it is the mere inner law that unites the system. The prevailing model of mechanical causality is external causality. For the chemical process, the inner quality of the chemical object is deep, deeply relevant for the resulting chemical process in a way that the quality of the mechanical object is not. But also here, the causality is linear and external. As we just said, the product is something else than the educt. The chemical process is not self-determined nor starting itself. We speak of a chemical reaction, not of an action. The organism now unites these two opposed modes of being and thus is celebrated by Hegel as a dialectical existence. Life is metabolism. It stays the same, it keeps, keeps being the same living organism precisely because and as long as it fundamentally changes itself. The process of self-transformation is essential for this type of self-identity. Life can thus neither be described chemically in a Hegelian sense, that means as a change without inner preserved self-identity, nor can it be described mechanically, that is, as a self-identity without a necessary inner change. Therefore, life has an inner identity that is neither identical with any given momentarily embodiment, since the body, since the matter will be exchanged, nor can this inner identity be found outside of the living organism, be found outside of the living organism. An object is not, uh, sorry, an organism is not a mere object, it is a self. It embodies the structure of self-affirming and self-creating subjectivity. I will, by the way, in my presentation today, not read out any of the Hegelian quotes, yeah? so to keep it short, uh, there will be no quote of Hegel, they are all in the footnotes and I'm going to skip them. So you have to believe me that basically this is what Hegel says, yeah. but someday you'll see the written, the written manuscript and then you can double check that. So for Hegel we have reached the highest dialectical synthesis that nature can achieve because the very two opposing determinations of nature itself, äußerlichkeit und in sich sein, externality and interiority, are now truly united. While all the other stages of nature before life are only incomplete and one-sided unifications, unifications under the dominance of externality, interiority, subjectivity was never there in nature before as an object. Therefore Hegel claims that in life the idea, as we have heard it, is existing. Nevertheless, Hegel also tells us that this overcoming of nature is itself yet taking place in nature, and that therefore two new and qualitatively different, yes, even deeper forms of externality are connected with life. First, according to Hegel, in life a new dualism emerges between the generality of the species and the singularity of each individual living organism. The individual Organism cannot embody the generality of the species or even of life as such. It is but one limited instantiation of the potential nature of the species. Second, living organisms are confronted with an environment that is external to them. The organism truly is a center in a world, but a fragile one. The center is the phrase that Hegel uses here. And, and he means in a different sense than the sun is a center of a mechanical uh, system. It's a subjective center. Environment can be food and nutrition, but it can also be danger and death. Furthermore, living organisms are challenged by other live or living organisms that can be both helpful members of their own species or mortal enemies. Interest, pleasure and pain, help and harm, categories of the life of subjectivity, 
Different from mechanical and chemical relations, different because of their teleological aspects, now enter the world stage. These processes belong to the logic of external teleology, because life itself has an extrinsic goal or self-affirmation that goes along with a Hegelian understanding of subjectivity. But by this inner goal, otherwise freely and externally existing circumstances are measured as good or bad, as threat or promise for the organism. Organic irritability and sensitivity is in its nature evaluative for Hegel. So now we have a gap between the centric nature of the organism and the otherwise indifferent or even sometimes hostile externality of other objects and animals. And that remains the dialectical challenge here for the organism uh, in Hegel's philosophy. Now the process of nutrition aims at overcoming the first form of this new externality, while the process of the species aims at overcoming the second one. Both fall, fall eventually short for Hegel. The individual organism is mortal. Hegel tells us the individual has to die and is finite just because it doesn't reach a true lasting universality in the process of replication, because it only produces yet another single individual that remains a different individual. Universality and singularity cannot be synthesized in nature. The beginning of this kind of an absolute synthesis can for Hegel only truly exist in mind. Therefore, for Hegel, because of its inner universality that is void of such an absolute external difference or opposition, the true first overcoming of this new externality is the mind. The mind, especially the human mind, already also in its finite form, therefore is no longer a part of nature for Hegel, but belongs to a different order. Let us now use this very brief sketch of Hegel's understanding of organic life in his philosophy of nature and compare it to some features in the corresponding chapters of the logic in order to shed some more light on the mismatch that we've spoken about before. Chapter 3, Hegel's organic compared to life and teleology in the logic. 3.1 the externality of the chapter on teleology in Hegel's logic. The chapter on theology, teleology is mainly concerned with the external relationship between a purpose and a mean, whose inner connection is essential, but whose inner identity only becomes manifest at the end, in the realized purpose. Only here do we find a balance between inner purpose and outer reality, or between Begriff und Realität, Subjektivität und Objektivität. Hegel uses the reflections about teleology, as we said, to constitute a transition from his chapter on objectivity to the chapter about life. We have just seen, however, how in the organic, the causal structure and the inner self-identity of organic life was conceptualized as a synthesis of mechanism and chemism. So one would obviously expect to see a corresponding logical reflection to be positioned here at the end of the chapter on objectivity. To be sure, Hegel explicitly refers to organisms here, and he proclaims that teleology as such, whether it is internal or external, is the synthesis that is needed here. Well, fair enough, but why again? is then the external tele teleology introduced before the internal one. Looking carefully at the logical development that Hegel presents, it is difficult to find a convincing reason for the sudden introduction of the logical equivalent of an intentional agent, that is, of an inner purpose that relates to objects via means externally. Where does this come from at this point in the logic? In order for us to speak about external teleology, some kind of purpose must be set or given. The chapter is spelled out in metaphors that are clearly reminiscent of internal, of intentional external teleological activity. In order to understand this, an agent, a goal setter is needed and must be logically constituted. 
This would precisely be the notion of an existing individual in objectivity, a subject-object, a subject-object, or it would be the concept as existing in objectivity. None of that can be found anywhere before the beginning of the chapter on teleology. In fact, objectivity for Hegel means that form of reality that is external to the concept, external to the subjectivity. The notion of a realized subjectivity in objectivity is only introduced at the end of the chapter about teleology, and then, of course, explicitly in the chapter on life. For Hegel, realized subjectivity belongs to the realm of the idea, not to the realm of objectivity. The constitution of realized subjectivity is therefore, for Hegel, obviously understood as a result of the chapter on teleology, while it seems evident that it should, nor must be, in fact, the premise of that chapter. I cannot see a plausible constitution of such a notion out of the logical development of the preceding categories. We have heard of mechanical objects and systems, and of chemical processes in the logic here before. We have not heard of something resembling intentions or drives before in the chapter on objectivity. If we say, as Hegel himself suggests, that it is that it's the begriff itself, yeah, the concept itself, that Hegel thinks about here, then following what is discussed in the chapter on objectivity so far, the begriff isn't realized as an entity within objectivity. Again, the realization or the unity of reality in begriff is called the idea, and that is the next chapter of the logic. The question we have to answer is thus. Why does Hegel nevertheless reverse the order that one would expect, coming from his philosophy of nature, and deal with the external teleology, and that means with a sudden, unmotivated introduction of a purpose, before he speaks about the inner teleology of life? What could be Hegel's reason to postpone the logical analysis of life, that could be a goal-setting yeah, entity in an objectivity, and to deal with it in the first chapter of the idea, rather than as a last chapter of objectivity. One could suggest that the main reason for this reversal is Hegel's extraordinarily high evaluation of the structure of organic unity or life. It closely resembles, yes, even embodies, his description of absolute subjectivity, which is the highest category of Hegel's thinking as such. The Begriff in the logic was already in some explanatory comments associated with freedom, with the I and with life. Furthermore, reflecting about life certainly played an important role for Hegel in his own development of his dialectical method, and the strange purposive identity of life was one of the riddles for any philosophy of nature at that time. Since Hegel conceives of objectivity as the realm of externality per se, one might argue that the highest possible, truly dialectic unity of life is for Hegel, as it was for Kant, a sign of something that goes beyond mere objectivity, something beyond the realm of the mere mechanical Cartesian understanding of nature. It goes even beyond a chemical interpretation. Following the Kantian reservation against a mere mechanical explanation of the teleology of life, Hegel is able to explain, as we have just sketched, in what sense life is, in fact, in its mode of being, truly too radically different from any other natural object to be just subsumed among them. Against Kant, however, Hegel can show a convincing way how to logically transform the natural categories of mechanism and chemism themselves and transition from their pure externality to the mode of being of life, thus overcoming the strict and rigid Kantian dualism of either a mere mechanical or ideal causation. You know, Kant says there are only two causations that we know, the reale and the ideale, and uh, life doesn't fit neither, you know, and Hegel. Has a, and Hegel has a very good, um, interesting uh, way of um, transforming the categories so that it makes sense. However, 
even though Hegel has uh, this step that goes beyond Kant, the mature Hegel, different from the young Hegel, is reluctant to ascribe to nature itself the power of this logical or dialectical self-transformation. He regards his dialectic of concepts as a purely logical affair. Self-determination, purpose, unfolding of conceptual implication seems to point to a realm or force that can't be conceptualized in natural terms. Hegel does not want to understand his philosophy dynamically. The steps of nature are not transformed in that way. And that's interesting because that would have been the early romantic idea, but now Hegel is more more cautious about that. And maybe it's some form of Kantian, I don't know, um, lingering on. Yes, some of this is lingering on that somehow, yeah, there's something, it's something different that we move through categories and that uh, we develop them out of each other. That's not the same as, a, as an external process. Processes in nature are external. So in uh, yeah, his nature, his philosophy of nature, he just says yeah, that this is not a dynamic process. So in the logic, Hegel states thus accordingly that the inner essence of life lies beyond objectivity. It is therefore called immaterial in the logic and associated with the concept of the soul. Accordingly, vitalistic passages against chemical and mechanical reductions of organic phenomena and a rejection of the idea of a natural evolution can be found in Hegel's philosophy of nature, and maybe more often than we might be comfortable with from a modern perspective. To summarize, since one would expect externality to be dominant in the chapter of objectivity and interiority, absolute unity, to be a sign of the idea, well, then life, thus understood, could not be part, not even be the last part of the chapter on objectivity. Therefore, it seems that Hegel argues that the mere external teleology has to come first, that it is lower than a true realized purpose, lower than the coincidence of, or the coinciding of mean and end, the coinciding of inner subjective purpose and external uh, objective reality is way higher than that external relationship. As a high unity, life in the logic signifies the status of Beisigsein, of the idea, or of a realized concept that has now its own reality and exists as its own objectivity. In other words, in his philosophy of nature, life belongs to nature. In his logic, life is associated with the idea. This leads to the question how life should truly be understood. Is it the last synthesis of nature, and thus a part of objectivity, logically speaking? Or is it the first part of the idea? Hegel seems to fuse at this point in his logic a more traditional, pure and glorified notion of life that we have to look at now. This is a notion of life that goes beyond the concept of biological material organicity, and is associated with the concept of soul, absoluteness and self-movement, and that has its own venerable philosophical history. In this understanding, life is an expression of the soul. This notion is then traditionally always connected to the aspects of material organic activity in our modern biological sense, but these notions are not the same. It is also possible to look at organicity as the most complex form of materiality of nature, that's the notion of life that gained popularity after Hegel, and that's primarily the notion of life that we use today. Which notion does Hegel aim at? Or if he aims at both, how are they balanced and combined? Next chapter, life in Hegel's logic and the finitude of organic life in nature. Hegel takes pain in his logic to argue that all three categories, mechanism, chemism, and life, are logical categories, not categories that only belong to the realm of nature. Already his students discussed that. There was a big debate whether the idea of life should be a part, or the concept of life uh, should be a part of the logic. So Hegel says these are general categories, not categories that we can only use in nature. Else, the whole philosophy of nature would just be a part of the logic. Uh, 
They are therefore to be understood, according to Hegel, as having a general meaning in a way that can be used to describe logical, natural, and mental processes. Yeah, so he speaks about mechanical states, he speaks about the life of the mind, etc. So this leaves us with two possible interpretations of the deeper externality of organic life that we have just discussed before in the uh, organic. Yeah? We could conceive of this duality, firstly, as a consequence of a merely finite manifestation of an otherwise absolute idea, whose first aspect is life. This glorified life in itself, logically understood, would then be truly an absolute unity of subjectivity and objectivity, the overcoming of all externality, and it would then be something singular. Uh, that's something to keep in mind here, that there are not many not many absolute ideas in the logic that compete or are needed to be synthesized. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a singular concept, the idea just as the begriff. Following this interpretation, the last chapter of the logic, the ultimate synthesis, would then have to speak about an absolute unity without any true or even let alone hostile externality. There is nothing outside of the absolute unless we want to speak about some schlechte Unendlichkeit. But it would still be possible to speak about a potential inner unfolding of this absolute unity in itself and its self-relations. Following Hegelian patterns, this absolute idea would have an immediate side, a reflexive side, and a unity. Now, however, all exclusively under the dominance of Beisigsein itself, so as not to fall back into what was defined as objectivity. This, however, would be, in fact, the logical idea of a mind or a soul. Now, Hegel tells us that it is the logical of no notion of life as such, with its implications, independent whether it is life or finite organism or finite minds, that he wants to address here. And he does equate that with the notion of the soul, as we've just seen. It's immaterial. For such a pure logical notion of life, understood as the immediacy of the absolute idea in singular, immediacy of the absolute idea in singular, if it were to be realized in nature or to manifest itself in the realm of finitude, it could be said that then the act of falling, falling into finitude or freely transitioning itself, this act would be responsible for all externality of earthly life and human subjectivity. This all would then belong to nature, but not to the pure idea itself. That is, however, not the story that Hegel tells in his logic. Hegel seems to follow another possible interpretation of this deeper duality, namely to understand it as a consequence of the immediacy of the idea itself. Hegel tells us that because of its immediacy, life first has to be understood as a single individual. But surprisingly here, singularity of the idea seems not to mean Einzelheit, as we would expect it from the idea, but it clearly is spelled out as a mere Besonderheit. This logical living individual is at once situated in an external objectivity, a realm of reality that it is not, and that it is only aiming at sublating. The categories of these external relationships that are now unfolded in the logic are in fact based, of course, on the logic of external teleological relations between a subject-object and a non-subjective reality, because Hegel now describes the process of irritability and assimilation, and then he follows that with the relation between a subject-object and a suddenly existing other subject-object. I don't know why the immediacy of the idea means now suddenly that there is another ob subject object. Yep. This makes sense, all of this makes sense in the philosophy of biology, in you know, the finitude of nature. But does it make sense given what Hegel is aiming at here at the end of the logic? In other words, does it make sense to introduce markedly finite notions of irritability, sensitivity, even suffering death, into the logic of the absolute idea.
I think there can be little doubt that these notions belong, in fact, logically speaking, into the chapter of externality, that is, into the chapter of objectivity. If the externality of teleological relations means they must be banned from the perfect unity of the idea, well, then also such a singular unity of subjectivity and objectivity in objectivity itself that these subchapters of life in the logic speak about well, then that also belongs to the objectivity. To summarize, looking at both chapter, teleology and the idea of life, and given Hegel's explicit understanding of objectivity on the one hand, and the unity of the idea in singular on the other hand, it would be much more plausible to treat life as the last part of objectivity, as a synthesis of mechanism and chemism, and then unfold the external teleological relationships there. And after that, transition to the chapter on the idea in an analogous way in that Hegel transitions from his philosophy of biology to the philosophy of mind. The idea of mind, not life, is the idea in its immediacy. And this would at once offer a lot of fruitful philosophical uh, insights, since mind or soul, to use the Hegel word, Hegel's word here, can't in fact be conceptualized in the same way as a material or external physical object. The mind is not in the world in the same way as water is in the glass, maybe not even in the same way that an organism is in its environment. The relationship between mind and nature are in no way conceptually or logically similar to that of organic bodies and food, let alone to mechanical relations. Mind may start in life, but the embodied aspects of life belong to objectivity or to nature, for that matter. These physical relations can and must be described with logical concepts that presuppose objective externality, and thus we can avoid all Hegelian vitalistic temptations. The mind itself can, it seems, not adequately be described this way. If we would make these changes, then in this way the division of Hegel's logic would correspond exactly with the main division of Hegel's real philosophy. The division between nature and mind would match the division between objectivity and idea. Only in mind, if ever, nature can be thought to go beyond itself in a way that requires new philosophical categories. I thank you very much or for listening to my presentation, and I look really forward to our discussions. See you all online, and hopefully next year then, after Corona, we all can meet in Spain. Thanks a lot for listening.